I'm thinking of taking a year off university next year, and I'd like to travel around Europe. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions one to seven. Good morning. How can I help you? I'm thinking of taking a year off university next year, and I'd like to travel around Europe. Okay then. Do you have any idea where you'd like to go? Well, I was thinking of starting in France and then working my way up to Eastern Europe, possibly going as far as Slovakia. Well, there are a number of ways you can do this, and we have various options available. It really depends on your budget and how you'd like to travel. That's just the thing, really.、Um, I mean, I've just finished my second year at university, so obviously I'd like to do it in as cheap a way as possible. That's fine. Could you give me a rough idea of the price range you're looking at? Realistically speaking, I'm hoping to pay between about seven hundred and nine hundred pounds. I could stretch to eleven hundred pounds, but that's really my limit. How long are you thinking of going for? About ten months. To be honest, you'd be better off travelling for about seven months if that's your budget. Okay, that's not too bad. So, how would you suggest I travel? Well, because of the time limit, I don't think walking is a viable option. Of course, in this day and age, the most convenient way to get around is by flying, particularly if you've got quite a bit you want to see in a short space of time. Saying that, I still think the best way to get around Europe is by train. As a student, you can also get a student rail card, which means cheap fares. That sounds brilliant. How do I go about getting a rail card? Well, if you decide that's what you want to do, then we can organise that all for you. You'll need to fill in a form and provide us with two passport photos,、mm -hmm. and we'll do the rest. It costs about thirty-six pounds plus about ten pounds administration costs. Great, that's really not expensive at all. And what about buses? I was just thinking, if I decide to go to places which are a bit more remote. There are always local buses, but these are not always a good idea. They can be quite unreliable and, in some areas, quite dangerous because the buses tend to be overcrowded and some of the drivers drive way too fast. So I would suggest you don't do this. That sounds quite frightening. So what are my options then? You could hire a car, but it can be expensive. Still. I do think if you're thinking about going to smaller towns and places which are off the beaten track, then hiring a car is by far the better way to do it. You can also look at sharing the costs by hiring a car with someone else. That's a good idea. I guess I could put a message on the internet. You could do that, but don't forget that you meet people when you're travelling, and you'll probably find someone who's going to the same place as you are. That's true. I want to stay in youth hostels, so I'm sure I'll find people who are interested in going to the same places.、Oh, one last thing: what about taxis? I was thinking about if I go out at night. I use taxis all the time here. Ah,、oh, but taxis abroad are a different story. In certain countries, they're no problem, but by and large, taxi fares are high.、Oh. If you do go out at night, try walking home, but make sure you don't do this alone. Try and find people to go out with at night, or come home at a reasonable time. But if you're staying in youth hostels, you should find plenty of young people to go out with at night. I'm sure I will. Now you have some time to look at questions eight to ten.
Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Now, have you thought about how you'd like to travel to France? Not really, no. There are basically three ways. You can go by ferry, which leaves every day and night, or there's the hovercraft, which is more pricey, but will get you there quicker, and, of course, you could fly. Well, I don't think flying is an option for me, as it'll be too expensive. So I suppose I'll choose one of the other two. It's a pity, really, as I don't fancy the idea of travelling by sea. Last time I did that, I got terribly seasick. <laughs> well, you're in luck then, as at the moment there is a special deal on flights to France. Ah. In fact, a plane ticket is now half the price of a ferry ticket, which is usually the cheapest option. That's great. I'll do that then. I much prefer flying anyway. I'll need to get some details off you then. Firstly, how will you be paying? Cash, cheque or credit card? If you pay by cheque, you'll need a cheque guarantee card. I don't have my cheque book with me, so it'll have to be by credit card. Fine, that's no problem. If you could just sign over here, and then we'll have a look at flight times, and I can sort out a youth travel card for you. Fine. Oh, can I use your pen, please? No problem. Now, let's look at times. There is a flight leaving at 9am, and one that leaves half an hour later... Or you can choose a later flight at 11.30. No, I think 11.30 is too late, so I think I'd prefer the flight that leaves after 9. I'm not very good at getting up in the morning. <laughs> no problem. Just give me a moment. Right, that's booked for you. Please remember that if you want to change this, you must give 24 hours notice or you will lose your place. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a tutor and two students discussing modern European writers. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. OK, so to continue our look at modern European writers who have focused on the future in their work, today we're talking about H.G. Wells. Last week, I asked you both to do some background research on Wells, which we're going to discuss now. Gitanjali, tell us about H.G. Wells. Right. So, H.G. Wells was a hugely successful British science fiction writer. Writing at the end of the 19th and the start of the 20th century, and much of his work focused on predicting the future. Jason, do you think Wells was just using the future as a narrative device in his fiction? No, no. He really believed we can predict the future. In fact, he gave a speech at the Royal Institution in London in 1902 called The Discovery of the Future, and the point he was making was that by looking at what you know about the present and about science, it's quite possible to predict the future. Indeed. Gitanjali, do you think Wells was always optimistic in his predictions? Not at all. In fact, 
He varied in his predictions from being extremely pessimistic about the future to being optimistic. Interestingly, one theory I read links the attitude in Wells' work to his own health. When he was writing The Time Machine, which was published in 1895, he'd just been diagnosed with an incurable fatal disease. Not surprisingly, the book is very pessimistic. Being about a dystopia in the future, a long time in the future, the year 802-701 in fact, where there are two races on Earth, the Morlocks and the Eloi, and the Morlocks actually eat the Eloi. I thought it was interesting, though, that it was H.G. Wells who actually came up with the phrase time machine. So despite being pessimistic, the work has had a lasting effect on our culture. Right. After the time machine, though, H.G. Wells didn't die, of course. And his recovery might be why he began to be a bit more optimistic about the future. So that brings us to his first utopia, Anticipations. Jason, tell us about that. Well, Anticipations, or to give it its full title, Anticipations of the Reaction of the Mechanical and Scientific Progress upon Human Life and Scientific Thought, was published in 1901 and was set in the New Republic of the year 2000. Some of the things Wells predicts are fairly close to our reality today, including 24-hour news, global telecommunications, and even a European Union. We'll come back to the accuracy of Wells's predictions a little later. Gitanjali, how was Wells's work received at the time? Well, although Wells was extremely successful, not everyone respected his work or his predictions. Another well-known science fiction writer, Jules Verne, viciously attacked him for works such as The First Man in the Moon, which Verne argued weren't rooted in scientific fact at all. That's right. Now, Wells wrote a number of other utopian visions of the future. Jason? Yes. In a modern utopia published in 1905, his vision was of a world where there's no private property, where everyone has access to wonderful health care, and interestingly, where everyone's personal information is stored on cards in a central database outside Paris. Apart from the health care, I'm not sure everyone today would see that as a positive view of the future. Neither am I. And, on a similar note, Wells strongly believed in population control and in The Shape of Things to Come, which was published in 1933, he sees and supports a world where the population is kept at 2 billion. Once again, I'm not sure most people today would necessarily see that as a good thing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Gitanjali, in your research, did you come across anything about the world brain? Yes, I did. It's actually very interesting. Throughout the 1930s, Wells predicted and supported the setting up of a huge world encyclopedia. And towards the end of the decade, in 1938, he wrote a series of essays called World Brain. In these essays, he called for the world to make use of modern technology to create an enormous global encyclopedia so that all our knowledge is available to all people, not just an educated elite. Wells envisioned this as probably being on microfilm, he thought it would allow anyone, anywhere in the world, to look at any book or any document. He also thought it would be created by everyone, once again, not just by an elite. 
Yes, and as you can imagine, many people today say that the internet has basically fulfilled his prediction. Of course, it doesn't use microfilm, but essentially, it does meet all Wells' main requirements. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students discussing the subject of rock art. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hello, David. Oh, hi, Mia. Sorry I'm a bit late. Oh, no problem. Thanks for agreeing to help me with my assignment today. I really needed to go over it with someone. Sure. You were going to talk about European rock art, weren't you? Yes, the rock drawings in the caves of Lascaux in Western France. Oh, fantastic. Over 13,000 years old, I believe. What sort of drawings are they? They're drawings of animals, on the whole, but you can also find some human representations, as well as some signs. There are roughly 600 drawings at Lascaux. Really? Were they mostly pictures of bulls? Well, no, actually. The animal most depicted was the horse. Hmm. Have a look at this graph. Hmm. It shows the distribution of the different animals. You see? First the horse, and then, after that, a sort of prehistoric bull. Oh, OK. That's interesting, isn't it? And the third most commonly drawn creature was the stag. There were some other animals, but these are the main ones. What are the drawings like? I mean, what sort of style? Well, the bulls are depicted very figuratively. They're not very realistic. They're very big by comparison to the other drawings of people and signs. They appear to be almost three-dimensional in some cases, following the contours of the cave walls, but... Of course, they're not. Amazing. Perhaps they felt these animals were the most impressive and needed to be represented like that. Yeah, maybe. The drawings of humans, by contrast, consist of just simple lines, like the stick figures my little sister draws. Perhaps humans were seen as less important. Hmm, perhaps. What about the signs? How did they draw them? There doesn't appear to be much evidence of signs, and those that have been found are usually made up of little points. Rather like Aboriginal art from Australia? Yes, something like that, but not as complex, of course. So, apart from the bulls and horses and stags, were there any other creatures depicted? In one or two chambers you do find pictures of fish, oh. but they're quite rare. What sort of size is the cave? It must be quite large to have that many pictures. Well, it's actually a number of interlinking chambers, really. Here's a map showing where the different drawings can be found. Oh, good. Let's have a look at that. The first 20 metres inside the cave slope down very steeply to the first hall in the network. That's called the Great Hall of the Bulls. Here. OK. Then, off to the left, we have the painted gallery, which is about 30 metres long and is basically a continuation of this first hall. But further into the cave. Exactly. Oh. Then we find a second, lower gallery called the lateral passage. This opens off the aisle to the right of the Great Hall of the Bulls. It connects the next chamber with an area known as the main gallery. At the end of the main gallery is the Chamber of Felines. There are one or two other connecting chambers, but there's no evidence of man having been in these rooms.
Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Is the cave open to the public today? Well, no, because after the initial discovery in 1940, it was opened and literally millions of people came through to see the drawings. Uh. Then in the 50s, the experts started to worry about the damage being done to the drawings and the government finally closed the Lascaux cave in 1963. Is that so? It wasn't really the tourists that were doing the harm, but the fact that after thousands of years the cave was suddenly open to the atmosphere and so bacteria and fungi started to destroy the pictures. You need a special permit to enter the cave now and very few people can get that, unless they're scientists or have some official status. It's a shame, but I can see that they had to do something to protect the cave. So that means you can no longer see this rock art? Well, not exactly. What they've done is recreate the drawings in a man-made cave, which you can visit. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. The authorities decided to reproduce the two best sections of the site, so they've created a life-size copy of the Hall of the Bulls and of the painted gallery. It's just a cement shell, which corresponds in shape to the interior of the original. So now you can visit the caves without actually harming any of the 15,000-year-old paintings. Mm -hmm. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Here an extract from a talk given by a lecturer from management department of a university on the topic job satisfaction. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Job satisfaction is how happy an individual is with his or her job. Scholars and human resource professionals generally make a distinction between effective job satisfaction and cognitive job satisfaction. Effective job satisfaction is the overall extent of pleasurable emotional feelings individuals have about their jobs and is different from cognitive job satisfaction which is the extent of individual satisfaction with particular facets of their jobs such as pay, pension, arrangements, working hours and numerous other aspects of their jobs. At its most general level of conceptualization, job satisfaction is simply how content an individual is with his or her job. Effective job satisfaction is usually defined as a one-dimensional subjective construct representing an overall emotional feeling individuals have about their job as a whole. Hence, 
effective job satisfaction for individuals reflects the degree of pleasure or happiness the job in general induces. Cognitive job satisfaction is usually defined as being a more objective and logical evaluation of various facets of a job. As such, cognitive job satisfaction can be one-dimensional if it comprises evaluation of just one aspect of a job such as pay or maternity leave or multidimensional if two or more facets of a job are simultaneously evaluated. Environmental factors One of the most significant aspects of an individual's work in a modern organization concerns the management of communication demands that he or she encounters on the job. Demands can be characterized as a communication load. Individuals in an organization can experience communication overload and communication underload which can affect their level of job satisfaction. Communication overload can occur when an individual receives loads of messages in a short period of time which can result in unprocessed information or when an individual faces more complex messages that are more difficult to process. Due to this process, given an individual's style of work and motivation to complete a task, when more inputs exist than outputs, the individual perceives a condition of overload which can be positively or negatively related to job satisfaction. In comparison, communication under load can occur when messages or inputs are sent below the individual's ability to process them. According to the ideas of communication overload and underload, if an individual does not receive enough input on the job or is unsuccessful in processing these inputs, the individual is more likely to become dissatisfied, aggravated and unhappy with their work that leads to a low level of job satisfaction. Superior subordinate in communication Superior subordinate communication is an important influence on job satisfaction in the workplace. The way in which subordinates perceive a superior's behavior can positively or negatively influence job satisfaction. Communication behavior such as facial expression, eye contact, vocal expression and body movement is crucial to the superior subordinate relationship. Nonverbal messages play a central role in interpersonal interactions with respect to impression formation, deception, attraction, social influence and emotional bonding. Individuals who dislike and think negatively about their supervisor are less willing to communicate or have motivation to work, whereas individuals who like and think positively of their supervisor are more likely to communicate and are satisfied with their job and work environment. A supervisor who uses non-verbal immediacy, friendliness and open communication lines is more likely to receive positive feedback and high job satisfaction from a subordinate. Strategic Employee Recognition Employee recognition is not only about gifts and points. It's about changing the corporate culture in order to meet goals and initiatives and most importantly to connect employees to the company's core values and beliefs. Strategic employee recognition is seen as the most important program, not only to improve employee retention and motivation, but also to positively influence the financial situation. The vast majority of companies want to be innovative, coming up with new products, business models and better ways of doing things. However, innovation is not so easy to achieve. A CEO cannot just order it and so it will be achieved. You have to carefully manage an organization so that, over time, innovations will emerge. Individual factors Mood and emotions form the effective element of job satisfaction. Moods tend to be long-lasting, but often weaker states of uncertain origins, while emotions are often more intense, short-lived and have a clear object or cause. Positive and negative emotions were also found to be significantly related to overall job satisfaction. It was found that suppression of unpleasant emotions decreases job satisfaction and the amplification of pleasant emotions increases job satisfaction. There are two personality factors related to job satisfaction, alienation and locus of control. 
employees who have an internal locus of control and feel less alienated are more likely to experience job satisfaction, job involvement, and organizational commitment. The characteristics like high self-esteem, self-efficacy, and low neuroticism are also related to job satisfaction. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.